Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever or whenever you are. This is the Lightning Podcast, where we discuss and explore the weekly lightning meditations without necessarily reaching any conclusions. I'm your host, Cyrus Polisbon, and I'm joined today by Zohar Atkins, Nicolas Sarian, Harry Jacobs, and a new guest today, a new member of our team, Rainer. What's Hello. up, man? Hi, doing good. Excited for this podcast. Excellent. We are excited to have you. The quote of the week is from Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and I'm going to ask Harry to read it again, as he did on the meditation. I certainly have, thanks to time, an interlocking and taking up of previous experiences and later experiences, but I never have an absolute possession of myself by myself, since the hollow of the future is always filled by a new present. Maurice merleau Ponty, Phenomenology of Perception. I only did a very brief reading up on Maurice and his views on, on, on you, the mind and the body. But Zohar, I, I would, would you, happily, would that, you but provide Cyrus, some context? Could you read that one? Because I feel like that's such a dense quote. I need to hear it multiple times. And I think... For the audience, you're not, it's not okay. going to hit on the first okay. reading and that's what yeah, I can read about, right? Um, okay. I certainly have, thanks to time, and interlocking and taking up of previous experiences in later experiences, but I never have an absolute possession of myself by myself, since the hollow of the future is always filled by a new present. Maurice Merleau-Ponty. All right, I'll give a little Ponte. context on Ponty, and then we can get into the, a, the substance. So good old Maurice was a, was a Parisian intellectual, like a lot of, uh, of the 20th century. He was part of the phenomenological school. I'll tell you in a minute what, what phenomenology is. He was a student, a reader of Heidegger and Husserl, who are some of the sort of big names and first generation of phenomenology. And you mentioned the body before. Ponty, his magnum opus is called The Phenomenology of Perception, and his big insight is an emphasis on body and bodily experience and sensory experience as core to cognition. We just ran a quote by Wittgenstein today from Uncertainty, where he says, kids don't learn that an armchair exists. They learn how to sit in the armchair. They don't learn that a dog he doesn't say this, but I'll extend the point. A dog doesn't learn that a Frisbee exists. He just fetches the Frisbee. And that's Ponty's point as well, that we experience mm -hmm. the world through our bodies. And so it's not like we mentally compute reality and then have to tell our bodies what to do. We first experience the world through a body and ourselves as having bodies, as being bodies. And only secondarily do we theorize or come to have an identity. Instincts, Instincts before, before abstraction. abstraction. So, yes. Like yeah, phenomenology point. generally has two words in it, phenomenon and logos. This is how being in time begins. A phenomenon itself contains the word phos, meaning light. A photon in chemistry, right, is a transmitter of light. I think phoenix is related to the sun, which was the ultimate source of light. So a phenomenon is that which appears but literally means that which illuminates itself, that which is revealed through its almost its self-lighting. And logos means speech, but we get the word logic from it and, and we built the concept of reason on the basis of logos. But fundamentally, logos means speech. And even more fundamentally, logos means revealing. So phenomenology means revealing with speech that which shows itself, that which is lit up. And the, and the core idea of that is that if we just had uh, phenomenon, phenomena, they light up, but they don't reveal themselves without the help of language. So phenomenology is the use of language to, to reveal that which already reveals itself. <laughs> and that's what the phenomenology of perception is. It's a 500-page doorstopper that's using a lot of words to reflect on what it is to have a body, which is a hilarious performative contradiction because, like, Probably most people reading that book in a library are very cut off from the rest of their bodies. They're just, you know, neck up and they're like, ah, yes. But the, <laughs> but the whole point of phenomenology is 
to expand the orbit of what counts as philosophy from just being ideas and thinking to being anything in life that has a certain experiential quality to it. So Sartre, who is a contemporary-ish of Merleau-Ponty, famously said that if you're sitting in a cafe and you're drinking a cocktail, and we got Harry Jacobs here smoking a cigar, that too is philosophy. What makes it philosophy is when you go from just enjoying it to reflecting on your enjoyment. And that reflection doesn't take you out of it. It it is part of the act itself. So Mm -hmm. I think in that context, we can understand Ponty is he's doing a phenomenology of identity and talking about how slippery this concept of the self is. Like we all walk around with a sense of identity, but when you reflect on what it actually is to be Cyrus or Harry or Rainer or Nico or so on, it's very difficult to actually say what what allows us to go from moment to moment and have a sense of continuity, right? You look at a picture of yourself from 10 years ago and you say, that was me. And you reflect on your future goals in 10 years and you say, in 10 years, I want to do X, Y, and Z. I want to accomplish X, Y, and Z. But you presume in all of those exercises that you're the same person. And yet, how is that really possible? Yeah, you're not the same person. Not even biologically. It's so incredibly deep to try to absorb all of that, right? All of what you said. There are so many thoughts that run through my head. And as I think about it, and I sit here smoking a cigar, as you alluded to, I think about what happens to me when I come and I sit and I light a cigar and I sit here and I'm sitting with someone that I know I can have an intellectual conversation with, right? I'm not talking about sports or fighting or anything. I'm, but to be able to sit and talk philosophy or talk about life or history, it changes almost automatically the minute I have this lit up. I can relax. I can think about what's inside of me. I can think differently about what's coming out of their mouth. It's almost a tool for the cafe to sit and have coffee and a drink and relax. I've had these conversations with Nico where he's at a, a cafe and there's coffee and, the, and he's just in his world. It helps us to one think. of the one of the great paradoxes of phenomenology, and it's all a similar paradox, by the way, with mysticism, is it simultaneously says philosophy is the most incredible thing in the world, just as you were saying, Harry. It, it, it's alchemy; it transforms an everyday experience into something incredible, and it's also so not a big deal. You almost don't need philosophy because you're already doing it. So then, what does the philosopher add? Like, if Merleau-Ponty takes his own advice, why is he spending his time and energy writing philosophy books and teaching philosophy in university? Why isn't he just out there living his everyday life? So it's like, you need the philosopher to help you see the philosophical content of everyday life. You need the mystic to tell you that everything is holy, because the ordinary person doesn't see that everything is holy. So I have always found that to be a paradox. I don't remember if I mentioned this on one of the other podcasts, but... There's a, the way that I resolve the paradox for myself is I think about it in three tiers. There's the teacher, the student, and the person who's so occupied with life that they don't even have the privilege to be the student. So the Baal Shem Tov, mm-hmm. who's one of the great sort of masters of Jewish mysticism, his students, whenever they would see him, they observed a halo around his head or an aura around him. But around other people, they saw no such halo. So they essentially venerated their teacher. They thought he was special. The non-students saw no halos, period, full stop. They couldn't see the halo around the teacher, around the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov, what do you think he saw? He, when, I, when he saw any single person, he saw a halo around them. So one group sees no halo. One group sees only one. And the master who has the halo sees it in everything. So I think similarly, the phenomenologist, the expert phenomenologist sees that everything is phenomenology. The students of phenomenology think it's just the philosophy professor that has it. And the students who, are, who have, or sorry, the, the everyday people who have halos around themselves, they're missing one thing, which is the awareness that they have that halo. See, I'll, I'll, I'll make it concrete. And, and this is a joke. But I, I see a halo around Cyrus, Harry Jacobs, Rainer, and Nico. Nico only sees the halo around me. 
and you guys mm-hmm. don't see any halos. It's so yeah, true. I think right? that's how it works. You know, and I talk about this every week. It's the, I'm a caveman. What am I doing here? I don't belong in this group of guys. You're right. I don't see it. Right. I look at that from you. I see it clearly from you, Nico and Zohar and, and even Cyrus. But I look at myself at the mir- in the mirror and say, there's no halo here. Right. Where is that? What is- that's not me. I'm an observer. Does that make sense? Or do I sound like a crackpot? I, I don't know why you're lumping me with them again, Harry. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I think I'm closer to the caveman. But uh, no, it totally makes sense. Uh, May I ask a question about how would you define Ponty as, as different or distinct from Husserl or Heidegger? What, what does he, what's his Husserl unique Husserl was that the that first. He adds? Yeah. Husserl was the first. Can I? Oh, you want to take it, Nico? Go for it. Can I take that one? <laughs> Nico, take it. Nico, Nico take I, it. I, I can take it. So I would say in a very simple way, you have Husserl, then Heidegger, and then you have uh, Merleau-Ponty. Husserl is the founding father of the discipline that we call phenomenology, although in the past people talked about phenomenology. There is no phenomenology without Kant. Uh, and this is something that I, I, could ex- I, I, I can explain why, but let me just finish like the... The, the trajectory that goes from Husserl to Heidegger. To put it, I think, in a, in, a, in a very easy way to understand, Husserl understands that everything is a phenomenon, and I will explain what that is. Then Heidegger comes in, into, the, into the play and he says, he bundles up the idea of the phenomenon with hermeneutics, with the idea of, and again, this is more complication, but, and then you have Merleau-Ponty, and I always said that Merleau-Ponty and phenomenology of perception is the missing chapter or like one of the missing chapters of being in time because what Merleau-Ponty says, there is no phenomenology without the body. And what does this mean? Because we normally think that, or we have perhaps a status quo idea that there is the mind and the body and they're two separate things. For Merleau-Ponty, there is no distinction, but it's not even that. He says that perception itself is the body. There is no body. There is no perception without a body perceiving there. So it's not. Doesn't, that we have uh, doesn't Heidegger already collapse the distinction with Dasein and, and move away from trans- transcendental phenomenology? Yes, but he yeah. doesn't talk, talk about the body. Mm, okay. Right? There, uh, there is no there, body there is, talk there in, is body in being talk, in time. But uh, it's not and... explicit or systematic. Like I, I agree with Rainer. It's all in Heidegger. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, he- Heidegger's focus <laughs> was on being towards death and how our relationship to death and our finitude and our experience of time makes the world meaningful to us. And especially in being in time, the emphasis is almost reads as moral, even though he says it's not, which is you should live an authentic life and understand this structure about yourself and then leap towards death by making authentic sort of the the kinds of choices that you would make in the face of knowing that you're going to die as opposed to pretending that you're not. And then later, Heidegger Mm -hmm. takes a little bit of a turn away from this sort of individualist emphasis in his inflection and goes more toward we live in a certain epoch and a certain culture and our epoch or our culture determines the kinds of projects that are available to us and the modern technological projects available to us are limited and their biggest limitation is that they don't think they're limited. So we need to at least first understand how we are limited by modernity and then with that in mind we can pave the way for some kind of future which he doesn't really define some new golden age that we can merely prepare and he gets all bleak and apocalyptic and says only a god can save us and that kind of i could go on for days and weeks on heidegger but the thing is when we are facing our death we're facing our death as bodies that die and disintegrate and heidegger doesn't really emphasize that in fact he distinguishes between an animal's death and a human death and says the animal merely perishes. He also speaks about, um, he has different words for death, but he says the inauthentic view of death equates it with demise or decay. So I think what Ponty is emphasizing is just in every single moment, our, the care that Heidegger talks about is deeply embodied. And so that, that shows up in if you have an existential relationship to yourself that's joyous or anxious or whatever it is, that really colors your perception down to a very fine and subtle level. And he gets into that kind of stuff 
in a way that Heidegger just keeps it a, a few levels higher. And then the other thing is, I remember a passage in Ponti where he talks about a hand touching, uh, my left hand and my right hand touching one another. Do you remember that, Nico? And in Buddhism and probably other Eastern traditions, they actually do this. It's called a mudra in meditation. You're supposed to hold your hands like this. And Panti yeah. says that when you do this, like you are experiencing yourself as both the subject and the object. You're experiencing yourself as both the giver of energy and the receiver of energy. And that, so that's an ontic thing that one can do this or not do this. But when you're doing this, all you're revealing is that is the ontological structure of what it is to be alive, which is to simultaneously be a body that outwardly perceives as well as a body that takes in sure. and so, to touch and to be touched. And so I, to Heidegger really to... does not get so tactile there. Like I would say, I'll, I'll, let me finish the point on this, which is well, I would say, let's do who's yeah. Heidegger and Merleau Ponty on what does it take for AI to be intelligent? I would say for who's the AI needs to be able to have good categorization good taxonomy, good conceptual, good, the ability to see something and understand what are the, what concept does it fall under? What are the subconcepts? If we can do that classification, we can call it intelligent. Heidegger would say, no, the AI is intelligent if it has a project for itself. And its project isn't based upon somebody telling it what to do, but based upon its own, its own most relationship to its mortality. So essentially, if the AI doesn't fear death, and it doesn't feel anxious before its own most finitude, then it isn't intelligent. And uh, it, without that, it can't be agentic. So mm -hmm. ultimately, intelligence is tied to agency, which is tied to, which is tied to self-awareness of finitude. And, and Ponty would say, AI cannot be intelligent unless it's embodied, unless it touches and is touched. And when you touch it, it isn't just that it feels pleasure or pain. It's, it, it feels that you're touching itself, like you're touching its being. When it touches you, it isn't just touching you and deciding whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, it's touching you with its being. And so it's basically, it, it, AI has to have a, a touch that's tied to existentialism. And, and so the self-driving car, like a Tesla that knows to turn left on, <laughs> knows how to turn left at a busy intersection, it passes, it passes Husserl's test, but unless it decides where it wants to go, of its own volition doesn't pass Heidegger's test. And then according to Ponty, perhaps it doesn't, it doesn't pass at all. And unless we could have, in, it could have intimacy with the road, whatever that means. So for Heidegger, that would be more like mm. the willing, like you said, like agency, but could well, you relate it to like later Nietzsche's Heidegger will, would, or is that would say that's an incorrect interpretation of Heidegger, but let's pretend that later Heidegger didn't say that and just focus on being time. Yeah. I would say, uh, I would say willing. I think the, the later Heidegger says that's imprecise because we don't know where the will comes from. And ultimately, the will comes from a more mysterious place, just as Meister Eckhart says about the rose, that it blooms without why. The will also comes from a place deeper than the will. And so the AI would have to tap into that, ultimately. To even have an unconscious, like I mean, an unconscious Heidegger would, or would something. say it's even deeper than the unconscious. It's like the ground of being or the mystery of being or something like this. The whole point in Heidegger is that is there's the notion of the fall, no? So being necessarily is being fallen, which means again that you cannot trace back like where the origin is from. That is constitutive of being. Is that related and to thrownness or is that a separate concept? Yeah, it's exactly. It's thrownness. It's thrownness. Being is thrownness. It's like you're thrown into the picture and you don't, and nobody tells you why. And that's, but that in itself is not, let's say, a, a nihilistic predisposition to the world. It's necessary. It's like it's the constitutive element of being. There is no being without fullness for Heidegger. Yeah. And let me just finish. Let me just round this up because there's a lot of things that I would like to say as, as a comment to what Zohar said. With the AI thing, with the AI element, in fact, in the States, like a lot of the people that were interested in Heidegger in the late 20th century were thinking about AI, someone like Hubert Dreyfus. We, we discussed this before, but perhaps the one of the two entry points to, in, of Heidegger in the States, one being Arendt, I think, right, Zohar? I think Zohar would, would agree. 
The other one is Dreyfus later on, which is a philosopher, professor at Berkeley, Heideggerian, a weird Heideggerian because he doesn't focus on being towards death. He focuses on the first part of being in time, but he's thinking about computers. So he wrote a book called What Computers Can't Do, and it's a Heideggerian critique of AI. Then he wrote a second one called What Computers Can't Do, I think five years later or something. The interesting thing is that by the end of the 20th century, you have a group of people thinking about what like the problem of AI. And if I can sum it up, why does AI not qualify for being, let's say, as having a being or let's say consciousness or whatever you want to call it, awareness of itself, that you can sum it up in one phrase, which is because it doesn't give a damn. Like AI doesn't give a damn about anything. It doesn't give a damn if what it's saying is actually true or not, it, or if there is any stake. There is no skin in the game for an AI. And that's why, from a Heideggerian sense, and this is exactly like fallenness, being towards death, that being in the world, all of these categories that Heidegger is always using are, in a sense, ex existentials, which means that there is a stake in the fact that you are where you are, always. AI doesn't have that. I would almost argue that AI does give a damn. I suppose it's garbage in, garbage out, right? What you put in is what you're going to get out of it. And, and for those listening, you, my voice may be familiar because I read some of these daily meditations for lightning. So WhatsApp group or Instagram, you know my voice, but I also read books and I do things with my voice and I have built an AI clone of my voice, which is frighteningly close to my voice. To the point where I would say, boy, it does give a damn. It can hear me breathe. It can hear me pause. It understands my cadence. It knows when I'm accentuating. I can help it to know when I'm accentuating a word. So to me, in a way, we can almost teach the AI to, to give a damn. But is it giving a damn? There's a certain species of birds like warblers and mockingbirds that can perfectly mimic the sounds that they hear, but do they really understand what they're recreating? You know? It's like a parrot, right? I, used, I had a girlfriend who had a, a parrot who the parrot would call the dog, right? Exactly. And she would, the parrot would mimic the, the girl's mother and she would say, Trixie, damn it, come here. Trixie, sit down. And the dog would be looking at the bird and the dog would sit. The dog would do what the bird would tell it to do. The bird had no idea what sit or come here means. Right. Trixie, eat your dinner, damn it. You know what I mean? It was just... Yeah. It was funny. So maybe the bird is like the AI. So I think the machine is simply learning the surface level stuff of Harry. And you're like, wow, it's, it's tricky. Uh, let me provide an example, which, which explains why it doesn't give a damn. It's not audio. It's ChatGPT4. So if you ask ChatGPT to, let's say, because I go through this on a weekly basis, provide uh, 10 quotes by, let's say, Walt Whitman, no? probably at least there's a specific percentage that it will recreate. It won't provide you with a quote by Walt Whitman, but it will create its own quote. That's not what you're asking for. You're asking for an actual quote, no? And then you fact check and you tell the AI, hey, this is not what I asked you for. And it goes, oh, I'm sorry, let me do it again. But it does the same thing again. So it's there is no, there is no skin in the game, if you will. There is no giving a damn because it's not, it doesn't understand responsibility because it has none. AI is imputable. It's, it's not going to suffer from its own mistakes or its own actions or its own decisions. So it's not that it doesn't understand moral responsibility or the fact that it's doing something for other people. It's the fact that moral responsibility is something you cannot understand or teach. Right. I, I guess a lot of people would, would, would agree with me here. Uh, you cannot yeah. teach those you, things. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You open a can yeah. of worms. If I ask a person who's low IQ a question, they also can't give an answer. I ask again, they still can't, but it would be wrong of me to expect them to. So is the problem in the chat GPT or in the expectation of the chat GPT? I agree. I totally agree. But I think there is a, call but, it a but, science fiction outlook on what AI is, given, let's say... Why did this conversation start is because I, I we were talking about you. Heidegger. I agree with you that it doesn't give a damn, but, to, yeah. but being, pedam being pedantic, I don't think the example proves that. I think the example proves that it's an idiot.
<laughs> if you it's ask them, wait, 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 let's go with that low IQ person. If you ask them that question and then ask them again and they still don't know, they're going to start to feel a little seen. They're going to start to feel a little embarrassed. They're going to, there's going to be some kind of response because they feel like they should answer you and they mm. don't have an answer or they're going to start to, there's going to be a physiological, there's going to be, they're not just going to be like, sorry, I don't have the answer. Looking at the structure of AI, like <clears throat> the structure, if you, if you want to break it into being and becoming, right? It has the parts of it that are structured, that are a- essences are basically like words or concepts that exist in like a conceptual space, right? And in, in the back end that it uses as reference, like arboratic kind of identities that it doesn't really own. The words are their own separate, distinct thing. And the part that's like rhizomatic, which is really what I think we call the AI, is this constant feedback loop that's basically churning these words in different ways to create novel responses, to write a poem or whatever. It takes these different words in different contexts and churns them. It's it's like a being or it's an entity of like pure becoming without being. It It doesn't own its own identity. Like it doesn't have a body. It's pure like flux and the things that it uses as body or as its output are, are like pre-existing things that it doesn't own, like words, right? It, yeah. That's um, how- I think it's a very good point, the one you're making, but if, if, if you want to get rigorous with, let's say, saying that AI is pure becoming and there is no being, the problem is that you cannot articulate such position without something not being becoming. If I want to get rigorous with it, no. Without I mean, I'm sorry, I don't like being becoming. This is not the way I behave in this podcast, but it's it's a good point. And, and the fact is that how can you stipulate becoming without something being becoming? That's a a, a, a big problem. I believe we we run a quote by Hobbes that points to this: is like, how can someone be the arbiter of their own actions? You can't. Nico, many manage to become what they can never be. We go I mean, keep going. Like to though. sell one, they can never give away. It's not the same thing. <laughs> okay, it's, I would... it's being. It's being oh, are the words. It's being is the words or the images or whatever. But it doesn't own that. It, those are pre-existing. A million images of, of an apple and a million images of a hat, and then it synthesizes mm-hmm. those into an apple wearing a hat. But its act, its body, is the synthesis mm-hmm. of two things that it, are not it. It's a com- combinator. Right. I, I agree. I agree with that. But what I'm saying is that you need. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do that. <laughs> the, 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 the phone, the AI did that. I had nothing. I was sitting there like this. The AI gives a damn. I think general intelligence you, is here. Yeah. I book. think general intelligence is here and it's making fun of us. <laughs> the AI. I was discussing this with a person the other day. It's, it's It goes off the tangent. But the point is that. and and this is a good example for all of this, it's it's not so much about being or becoming, but it's how can you be the arbiter of your own predisposition to whatever, no? This is not phenomenology. In fact, this goes against the the quote that we're discussing today, which is the fact that you do not have, you will always have a blind spot in, in your perception of the world. And that itself is perception, the fact that you have a blind spot. Let's say... Renaissance clarity, like perfect, what's the term? Anatomy, proportion, perspective. That's not the way how we live the world. We can see it in a painting, but that's not it. This is why Merleau-Ponty was so interested in, in, in the Impressionists and artists like Cezanne, Paul Cezanne, because, sorry, Paul? Mm-hmm. Who's Paul, yeah. Because when they were trying to capture a mountain, let's say we present a mountain, Mont Saint-Michel, which is the famous mount that Cezanne painted so many times, they were trying to capture the perception, the embodied experience of that mountain. And what you get is not a clear-cut, distinct forms, good, let's say, rational proportion. What you get is this colorful and misty and dissolving landscape where everything, that's perception. And that's what Merleau-Ponty is talking about, the fact that you cannot have a self-possessed image of yourself. It's always going to be a form of letting go, dissolution, coagulation, this becoming, as you say, it it would be that, no? I think it's not becoming 
self-possessed as becoming. It's, I don't know, it's being <laughs> to be. Yeah. So that's fantastic because I was going to ask, I wanted to bring us back to the quote. So you're saying what he means. So earlier Zohar said, I can't have an absolute possession of myself since the holiday of the future is always filled by a new present as saying, I'm always changing <clears throat> as a person day by day, year by year. But you're saying, Nico, it's a more of a no, even shorter than that. Moment by moment, it's this mercurial. What I'm saying is that uh, you, you cannot even perceive the fact that you're changing. That's the, that, that would be like proper. Like to give you a totally different example, I was having a conversation with a person, I believe it was two nights ago, and a filmmaker, and he, he was, we were discussing AI actually. And I was, we were talking about the Matrix, and this person was interested in Nick Bostrom, the, we live in a simulation. And he was entertaining these ideas of AI, the, where it's going, where it's going to be, like what it's going to become, like artificial general intelligence, we're going to be like governed by... And what I told him is, look, like if you really do a rigorous analysis of AI and like subscribe to, the, to that idea that AI, that you believe that AI will be like self-conscious, whatever, the conclusion you should get is not so much that it will become that. And this is the Bostrom or the, what's it called? The Basilisk. It's this, it's this conclusion you get to, which is, it's not that it's going to happen. It already happened and you're being simulated now. That's mm. the conclusion these people should have because it makes no sense to believe that AI will become such a thing in the future. If there is a possibility or there was a possibility for AI to be that, it already happens, and we are living in a AI-governed simulation. So it's like taking the real stakes for what you're where you're standing from intellectually. It's if you take it full heartedly, like you have to subscribe to that idea. If AI has that possibility, that capability of it already happens. It seems if all things lead to AI triumphalism and that this is predetermined, it sure took the AI a long time to get there. And so my question would be, why did you pick the year of 2024 or the decade of the 20s, the 2020s, to reach your culmination and not sooner? Why did you sequence it, AI Lord, in, in that way? And I would ask the same question that I ask the pantheists, the Buddha who says all things are Buddha nature, Hegel, who says history ends in 1806 with me writing the Phenomenology of Spirit, or Spinoza writing in the 1500s, or 1600s rather, that everything is God. Oh yeah, why did, why did God, who is everything, wait until the 1600s in Amsterdam to reveal that truth through, through Spinoza? Why did the absolute spirit wait for Hegel in the 19th century to reveal that? It seems like the one thing that enlightened people can't understand is the specificity of why the enlightenment took place in a particular time and place if in fact it's this universal transcendental thing i'm skeptical i'm skeptical that the ai represents the end of history and i'm skeptical that it was predetermined skepticism name of the day guys sorry for the shorter recording today folks but that's just how it goes bye